Lady Bonnie, such an honour to have you on this podcast. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time out. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, know Bonnie, shame on you. Um, she's uh, one of the world's uh, top brand strategists that uh, could be silver steering partners and um, has just come up with this absolutely marvellous book uh, called The Life Brief. And uh, so Bonnie's very kindly taking his time out today to, uh, to to talk with us about the book and, and how it came about. And I'll stop talking, but thank you, Bonnie, for, for coming and joining us. It's incredible. How did this get started? Tell us a little bit more about it and, uh, and yourself. First of all, thank you for having me. It's a real honor and pleasure. And thank you for calling me a lady. Um, I don't think that's ever happened before, especially not in, in, a, in a public way. <laughs> <laughs> it's another we'll, we'll, we'll get the title in the post i'm gonna have to play that for my kids um yeah this all started because i've been doing brand strategy almost with my eyes closed now after three decades and so when i hit a speed bump in my marriage more than a speed bump a ditch a downright ditch it was my natural reflex in my darkest hour and uh, it really helped me almost immediately shift my attention and my sense of what was possible. Um, and I can go into that story if you like, or. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I think it, it, what struck me when I was reading this book was you know, how open you are on, on, the, on the problems you're facing, ranging from, from the problems you faced in childhood up to, 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 to the, to the, problems in, in your own personal relationship and marriage. It's amazing. And, and shout out to Chip if you ever watches this or reads it. Um, big fan and, uh, and, and, and congrats to you too on, uh, on marrying such a lovely wife and being so marvelous. Uh, uh, so uh, yeah, please do, uh, uh, do, do share how it came about. Yeah, just brilliant. Yeah, thank you for mentioning and giving a shout out to Chip. I, I say he's the strongest man I know because he's allowing me, he's he's embracing the fact that I'm sharing with the world all of our most troubled um, marriage moments and then also allowing me to write about it. And, you know, I think that takes a brave soul, especially if you're not the author, you're not the storyteller. Um, but in 2010, we were strapped with, three young kids under the age of five. And I know you're welcoming yeah. in your first, so please don't let it terrify you. Um, please, congrats. Well, now I have four and they're, wow. they're, they're all above, my youngest one is now 10. So she didn't even exist in 2010. And it was hard as many parents know of that, new stage of parenting it's so much chaos and the kids need so much and it's natural as parents to put yourselves last and we had really different parenting styles you don't know this when you're courting each other you know we don't court each other and interview each other on how how the ways we were raised and how differently we were raised, how that will shape how we show up in a crisis mm -hmm. moment or in the chaos. And we had to learn that as many couples do as they enter the parenting stage. And I realized that I was carrying a lot of the load, more than what I felt was the fair share of, share of the load. I was the sole breadwinner. I was... Um, the, the the person nursing and holding and comforting the children. I was also cooking and doing the housekeeping. And my husband hadn't really been raised in a culture where those were things he was taught to do or expected of him. And so in those early years, that really rubbed against each other. And he wanted to be helpful. He just didn't know how. And in my mind, the less sleep I got, the more exhausted I was, the more critical I became, and the more bitter I became. But in the fury of parenting and holding it all and doing work and juggling all the things you have to do on a daily basis, you don't get a break. Um, so it really erodes your sense of communication, your empathy, your patience, all those things. And a year and a half into a lot of this chaos, I felt 
very much that I was at the end of my rope. So that was the darkest hour. And in my head, I really believe my husband was the problem. <laughs> um, I, I think probably a lot of ladies could relate or even husbands too, right? I, I think it, the first person we point to is the person we that. are. <laughs> good, good. We're going to play this over and over for her, um, especially after uh, she gives birth. But it was it was hard and I couldn't get past the story in my head. It was yeah. just it felt like cement. And I was certain I, I held it with such certainty. And as a strategist, um, as you know, being in the same business is we collect the data points before we arrive at an answer. What we're doing, what we're really good at is tuning into our curiosity and asking a lot of questions, asking it of many different sources and collecting it in many different ways. And so in my darkest hour, I opened a notebook out of panic, really, and out of despair. I didn't know where else to go. And I allowed myself to just what I call now get messy, which is what strategists do when we're doing research. We're allowing ourselves to get messy, sit with the mess, you know, hear all the perspectives. Um, a lot of them are contradictory, but we're looking to connect dots or see what's between the lines. And so late one evening, I unpacked it all. I let it all dump out onto the page and I wrote and I wrote with what I call now naked permission. I just freed myself to answer the question that was burning inside me, which is what do I want with this family? in this marriage, if I could change it to make, to bring me back to aliveness, what would that take? And naked permission meant eliminating the voices, parking away the voices of my parents, of my husband, even my children's needs, my friends' opinions, and really allow myself to dump it all out. And I, I don't remember how long, how many hours I wrote, but once exhausted, I was able to sit back with newfound spaciousness and then to reread it all with a little bit of distance, emotional distance. And what I saw on the page was very different than the story in my head. Because the story in my head, again, was my husband was the problem. And what came out on the page was not that my marriage was broken, but it was that my relationship with time was broken. And what I longed for in my heart of hearts was time, time with my children, time with Chip, and dare I admit it, but time for myself, which was a source of guilt. For a mom, I had a really deeply seated, tattooed impression um, or definition of what being a good mom meant and it meant putting yourself last. You put everyone else first. My culture also, you know, in Asia really promotes that. That's how you're raised. Society comes first, family comes next, you know, and you're there to serve. And, but I was able to admit these things. And once I was able to see, that was the aha that immediately appeared is that, oh, it's Chip isn't the problem. It's how I'm spending my time, all the ways I was running myself ragged and thin and all the things I was saying yes to that I should have been saying no to. And so immediately it shifted my attention to a new problem to solve. And it shifted my attention away from the problem I thought was there for a year and a half, which was my husband and my marriage. And when I shared that first life brief or my distillation of how I wanted to reimagine time in our relationship with time, I shared that with Chip that night and he immediately texted back, Y-E-S, all caps, triple exclamation mark. And it was our first moment of alignment in a very long time and our first moment of hope. So that's a really amazing story. A couple of things came to mind. One was, did, have you ever done that uh, sort of love language uh, test between two of you? It's a sort of, you know, is it acts of service, I think is one of them. And then mm -hmm. uh, 
other other ones are sort of um, it's acts of affection or something. So, so. No, but now I'm I'm going to do this. <laughs> it, it'd be interesting to see uh, see. But the um, the other thing which you you did so well, and I think actually the book kind of goes into a loss is most of us probably know that we want something to change and we probably think it's one thing but actually it's normally something else so i think finding out what that other thing is that what's the real core deep problem is so difficult um to to find the answer to that often um what are some of the exercises that that you've come up with or, or learn um that, that you've ended up teaching to, to help find what that true what the true problem or what the true questions are that you're trying to ask or the yeah, true problem is? Well, it's so wonderful being a strategist because you're trained to ask penetrating questions and you're mm -hmm. trained to help um, when you get in front of consumers or uh, stakeholders of a company, you're trained to help them think about things more creatively or conceptually so you can break through their normal scripts because that was the script that was running in my head yeah. and I had to I had to um, I had to shatter that script and open up space for a new story, and so that's what we're trained to do as strategists. And we have a whole tool toolbox, which I know you're familiar with, and really the book is just chock full of them at the end of each chapter. And it's taking a lot of different angles at the same, you know, um, with the same objective, right? Which is to unpack. What are the deeper layers? We we talk about it as peeling back the onion. You know, peel back all the layers of the onion so that you can get to the essence of what you want, get to the essence of what matters most. And that's what I love about brand strategy because it's all about finding the essence in a situation for a company, distilling it down to its core. And so there's so many prompts and exercises. Some of my favorites are just getting you to write um, and capture with naked honesty that daily brain dump. Five minutes, 10 minutes. It, it becomes less scary, less daunting when you just allow yourself to practice being in relationship with yourself, meaning not editing yourself and putting it out there. My other favorite one is about writing a eulogy because sometimes we're so, um, we're faced with the urgency of right now, what's calling to us right now. Uh, and, and there's so many things in life now, in modern life. But when you think about the end of your life and what you want people to be celebrating about you and your legacy and the impact that you've had, it takes you to a different space and it helps you identify what's truly important and where your values are. And mixed with the urgency of now, that creates this tension that propels new possibilities and helps us see our situations differently. I love the eulogy ones as well. I thought it was so, so brilliant. And the, the, the brain, the brain dump, uh, I thought as well, it was very powerful. This sort of idea of, I think you, meant, you mentioned in the book, there's sort of there's a very big difference between writing things down and paper, with pen and paper versus typing things as well, like voice noting things. Like there's a, I think you're absolutely right. It does seem to, to have a big difference. And then sort of that, the, the way you described the brain dump, if I remember rightly, you can tell me whether I got this wrong. Um, was was really just to write down all of your your fears, your hopes, your dreams, anything that comes to your conscious or subconscious, um, and and just don't stop until and, until it's all out there. And if you hit a blank bit, I think you you said to just even write down, I don't know what to write until that's right. Else comes. It is so um, it, you know, so so brilliant, and that a very powerful um, a very powerful message. So so thanks that. I know with 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 your industry and 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 uh, well, a lot of people who, who are probably listening to this are also in advertising or marketing or some way, shape, or form. Um, there's a there does seem to be in in with creative people that you you mentioned this as well. I think they they tend to have a kind of more of a um, I don't know whether can do spirit is necessarily, but 
the right way, but they tend to be more optimistic, particularly if you're a creative, because I think you'll have to deal with failure a lot. Um, and that, and in regards to changing your life, it's sort of maybe a big stumbling block seems to be to how people helping get people get past their limiting beliefs. Um, how are some of the ways that you've managed to leave that? Well, you mentioned, you know, the creative spirit. And I think before we got on the podcast, you were talking about being in South Africa at Ogilvy yeah. and that office in particular having an especially rebellious spirit. I find creatives are nonconformists. People who are artistic in any form or love creativity or love solving problems, they're always seeking um, a new answer, a new solution, a different way of thinking about things. So I think it's a mindset that they've cultivated over time. I like to call the life brief a practice that anybody can do. I believe creativity is a practice as well. It's the practice of seeing situations differently so that you can meet them with new answers, right? And you can navigate them differently. So Creativity always starts with seeing something slightly differently than what convention would have you see. Unfortunately, I think we're conditioned from our earliest stages of life to uh, flow with expectation, to show up and color inside the lines, not be disruptive, follow the rules, be really good at jumping over the bars that are set in front of us. And it's all given to us, these maps, out of love and good intention to keep us safe and help us succeed. But it does eventually narrow the space um, and our muscles for creative thinking, which is what could a different possibility look like? Um, another exercise is just playing with what ifs, coming up with as many what if scenarios um, positive what ifs, because I think there could be negative what ifs that your limiting beliefs take you down these rabbit holes. But playing with just in a lighthearted, free, permissive way. What if I did that? What if I looked at it this way? What if I related to money in this way? Or what if I saw this? Divorce is one, one of the things that I talk about in the book. It's through someone else's story. Um, someone was held in a really toxic relationship because her definition of marriage and also her definition of divorce kept her in something that was increasingly unhealthy for her. Yet when she was able to reframe, and this is something that strategists do really well, right? Reframe a situation to see it differently. When she was able to stop seeing divorce as failure, and was ready to explore divorce as a new beginning, not just for her, but her also her partner, that this could be a new beginning and adventure for both of them. Then she was able to start imagining new possibilities and turn from this really, the sensation of being trapped in her life to a sort of aliveness and excitement for what could be if she could face and confront this fear head on. It's so lovely. And, and, that, and that was a very powerful story. And you've got a, got other stories like that in the book as well. So that's another reason why everyone needs to buy the book immediately and read it. Um, so there's one thing I thought that was very brilliant in the book is you talk about the power of um, starting things small. It kind of reminded me a bit of an MVP. I think like with a lot of the concepts that we're talking about, they can seem very overwhelming. It's like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get a divorce and start a new life. Or I'm going to change the way I'm doing this. Um, would it be okay to talk a little bit more about that? The, the sort of the, the power of that. I think it just makes it more, much more approachable. It's, it's brilliant. Yes. I think the reason people are terrified about doing practices like this is that they're going to unearth big change. And yes, yeah, so we just talked about divorce. But for me and my husband, it really helped us get back in on, on track with each other. Um, and it kept us together. And I've had two long standing relationships in my life. 
Um, one is with my husband for 23 years, and the other is with my agency, Could Be Silverstein Partners, where I've been there for 25 years. Um, but there are many chapters in each of those long-term relationships. It isn't just one arc that has a constant. There are a lot of mini chapters in there, and this practice has helped me define each of those chapters in a way that feels deeply engaged, feels exciting, um, satisfies and serves my own growth while being able to serve those relationships in new ways. And starting small is really a beautiful act because I find when we make tiny shifts in how we speak, how we show up, it automatically sends an invitation out to everyone else around us in that situation or in that relationship to also shift how they respond, how they react to you. And without lecturing or without telling them or whether forcing, it's this organic way of inviting them in to change how they show up. And then the whole dance changes. And, you know, a lot of people talk about the ripple effects. I find amazing ripples in the smallest acts of change. In fact, there's a story, uh, it's one of my favorite stories in the book. It's, it's just a small one. It's not one of those big momentous ones, but it's a writer um, who was working on her novel and she just found herself paralyzed. It, it's daunting to write a book, um, much less a novel, which I've written nonfiction, much easier for me than to imagine all these characters and storylines. But her tiny daily commitment was not even to write, but it was to open her document every morning just to open it. So that was as small and inexcusable and irresistible that she could get to from a commitment standpoint. And every time she opened it, something would happen. Sometimes she'd just write a sentence or two. Sometimes she would write 200 words or 500 words. And after just six weeks of doing that, she realized, wow, the progress she made was enormous, but it started with a really tiny, inexcusable, irresistible commitment that she held on the daily. So it uh, reminds me a lot of the kind of uh, advice that you get from Atomic Habits. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, how is the book writing for you? I, mean, uh, you, you, I take it you haven't written many, many other books before. Like, how did you... How did you get into this? What was the, how, how did you find the process? Well, I didn't pursue it. So it was an invitation. I'd been teaching the life brief for 10 years already. And it was my, uh, I call it joy hustle or way of giving back. How do I give back and serve in lasting and meaningful ways? And it really was a joy to do it every time I was invited. So I had a promise to myself that anytime I got an invitation, I would say yes. And that's how it kept going for a decade. I met a literary agent, the just incredible Rachel Newman, um, with this incredible agency called Idea Architects. And they had an interesting model. And she said, I think it's time to write the book, The Life Brief. And I was terrified immediately because I'm a strategist. I distill, my job is to distill things into one word maybe three words or one sentence, one single-minded idea. The thought of writing an entire 250 book, uh, page book was, it, it seems so daunting to me. But she helped me find my way of doing it. And it, and it coincided with the pandemic because I also am a parent to four kids. So running the agency, leading client work, and... Um, having four kids in a pandemic was really hard, but it removed all the flights across the country, the barbecues, the happy hours, the soccer games, sorry, the football games, the um, gymnastics meets. And I wrote it over three and a half years on Friday nights, Sunday mornings, in the slivers of time, 
wow. that I could break free from my other responsibilities. So my encouragement to writers is that you can do it. You can do pretty big things in the tiniest slivers of time. Yes. Uh, well, thank God you wrote it. Thank you. Um, and then how do you get deep pack shape bread to, to write on as well? That's, that's amazing. I mean, how are the, I think it's part of a general question is where is this taken you? I mean, you and know, before the book, you've been running these as workshops. You must have some fantastic stories of meeting amazing people and hearing incredible things from people all over the world, I'd imagine. Well, the beauty of advertising is it's a industry of breadth, right? You study so many different categories and industries and you meet a dizzying array of leaders. And I think stepping into the publishing world, it just opened oh, so many of those doors. But my secret is, is um, I haven't told anyone else, I've never met Deepak Chopra. So it, it, you know, just like the advertising world and marketing world, it, it's, it's small and there, it, it's relationships. So someone passed him my proposal and, and, and the, the manuscript and he, he, read it and wrote a beautiful um, endorsement of it. That was a reminder sort of the power of like not being scared to ask people uh, for things, even if you don't, don't know them. Um, I had to learn that very, you know, I in the book launch period and the book creation period, I had to ask a lot of people of other things. And that was, that was my weak spot. That was my Achilles heel. I was too shy, too proud, um, too nervous. I didn't, you know, I didn't want to be turned down, but you learn in any startup. And I think a book launch and a book creation is very much its own startup. You just have to learn to ask everyone for everything. Yeah. I mean, with so many things in life, I think it's sort of uh, mm -hmm. things seem unsurmountable. And then when you ask for a little bit of help, normally my experience so far in life is that normally most people are lovely and they always do help. Um, so true. It was interesting talking about the shyness and in the book you go into a lot about the, your childhood and it seems like you, you've sort of gone through periods in your life where you were sort of maybe a, a very extroverted and then other, but, but maybe and maybe going against what you what, how you really felt um, because of uh, maybe stereotypes or positions that, that you found yourself in. How's... Well, I'm a practiced extrovert. I say that. Um, and, and there were years in my career where I believed I am an extrovert. Um, but as a child, I was very shy. I didn't know the language when I immigrated to the U.S. And that furthered my inhibitions. And then there were a couple really dark moments of trauma, you know, that I experienced, I, I think, there was a lot of casual racism, and then there were just growing up in the 70s um, as a latchkey kid, just not being safe in a community as, as a young young girl. Um, and I think those all contributed to my shyness or um, my introversion. But my longing to belong was so great that it it really fueled me getting clarity in eighth grade to show up differently. I didn't want a life on the periphery or in the corner. I wanted to taste all the things. I wanted to experience so many things. Um, and I guess I did have this motivation to come out of my shell. And that propelled me forward. It was my first act of discovery, the power of clarity. When you do get very clear about what you want and you are able to express it and if not declare it to yourself, it automatically shifts your attention and then action. And that's what happened to me at a very young age. Now, it also cost me because that longing for belonging was so intense that I didn't know it at the time, but it forced me to assimilate and shed the parts of my heritage and my identity that now I look back with some shame, you know, in the ways that it cost me because I was 
really leaning into what I thought the world wanted of me in order for me to be worthy. And I played into that. And then later as an adult in advertising in my career, I learned that the art of assimilation also was the way to play the game and get to the top. And I did it really, really well. Um, not in a not in a manipulative way, but you know, um, you you learn that the system wasn't designed for women of color. So you adapt and you start, you know, taking on the behaviors and it, it, it be does become its own performance. You know which relationships to cultivate, where the political currency is, you know, all those things. And you try to do it as authentically as possible. But in 2020, you know, with the global pandemic and all the things that were happening in the, the unrest and the violence in the U.S., I had to really take a deep, hard look and examine the ways that I was defending and serving a system that wasn't designed for people like me. And I had a choice as a leader. What, was, what am I going to do about that? And how am I going to make those tiny shifts? Or maybe not so tiny, but bigger and braver and bolder shifts so that I can open up the system to include more people. Now, I think you were saying that uh, I hope I'm remembering it was right, but you you run something with your teams uh, to sort of uh, on a weekly or a monthly basis or something. If I remember, I need to do there was some some something that you do to check in at meetings or something that to find out what people are really feeling and give them space. I think. I yeah, I don't know. I don't even remember how much I talk about it in the book, but I did flip my time because right. uh, as a leader, you tend to spend a lot of your time with the other leaders because. Yes. You have to make decisions, but that becomes your kind of um, circle of people. And um, that's where the power center is. And I realized that I need to get in touch with people who are underrepresented. I needed to get in touch on a regular basis with my most vulnerable employees. And so that they had a direct line to power. And I had a direct line to what happens in the microcosms of daily agency life, daily company experiences, daily client interactions. And so it was really important for me to shift where I spent my time, who I spent my time with, so I could learn from them. Yeah, that you shared a lovely story of, I think it was someone in a, in one of your briefs or one of the creative meetings and they they were saying there was an ad that you had of a, a doctor and it was going to be a, a white doctor. And they were like, why do we always have white doctors? Can we have a person of color as a doctor instead? And it's like, oh, yeah, good idea. Like, that was such a brave, it was such a brave thing for a junior employee to advocate, right? And what we don't see is how quickly these meetings operate and how the same voices get the most space. And it's very hard for someone who doesn't feel safe because of either past traumas they've experienced, past um, biases, um, not even in our agency, but from their previous experiences, because you carry those traumas with you. And it's hard to break through and, 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 and especially to add an idea that might be taken the wrong way or countercultural. And so it was the leader in the meeting, and um, it was this wonderful account director, but he just created a simple pause before the meeting ended and just said, okay, let's, I just want to ask, are there any other thoughts that didn't get expressed in the meeting? And that just allowed a spaciousness for someone to bravely share their comment. And this young strategist who raised the question about, yeah, shouldn't the doctor be a black doctor? Because wouldn't that be meaningful and powerful? And it's just these tiny shifts. Again, we're going back to the doing it in small ways, but they have big outcomes, big ripples. So for leaders to just really be intentional and conscious about creating space for other voices who might have hesitation 
Because in a creative company, one of the biggest threats is self-editing. When your employees don't feel safe to share their bravest, boldest, wildest, most unexpected and innovative ideas, when they keep it to themselves, that's a huge cost to any innovation-driven or creativity-driven company. And the biggest um, danger in it is you can't measure it. You'll just never know when people hold back. And so these, mo- these small but significant ways that leaders can shift how they show up in their work, in every meeting, in every conversation, has a massive impact on the future of a company. That's I totally agree. <clears throat> and so lovely that you're giving the space for these people to tell them become braver. I think advertising is one of these things where it's, it's, it's in the scale of importance of things in the world, it's not massively important, but it has a dramatic effect on the, on culture and, and the way we perceive things. So these things, even these small things that you're talking about there have, have a, disproportionate effect, I think, on culture and society. It has a huge effect. I know advertising is being challenged right now, and it's a smaller part of the, you know, marketing pie and, you know, lots of industry debates around it. But think about the media dollars we have to work with, how much gets amplified, you know, how much reach we get and exposure. And we are trained in the art form of persuasion, of behavioral change, you know, about, and and just the, the business of creativity. How do we shape our collective consciousness? There's so much power in that. And so there is um, so much we can do in the stories we tell, the way we tell them, and who we're telling them for. I was turning to someone to say that, who's in a, a, more in a sort of PR space, um, he was saying, uh, I thought it was really interesting. He said that if you think about it in the last kind of five, 10 years in particular, the news just in general uh, that we all listen to has been probably fair to say negative. <laughs> so yeah, it's, not, it's not been great. There's been, you know, lots of. It's an understatement. <laughs> That's an understatement. Lots, lots of wars and very strange people in, in positions of power all over the world. And, and, it, and I think people are very fatigued by that. Um, and it's interesting, he, he, his sort of thing was like brands and, and advertising in a way has an opportunity to, to be an antidote to that, to, to, to sort of share something that's uplifting, that's positive, that's interesting. Um, I think one of the things he had done was he worked out that in the UK, the average cost of living per month, something was um, £750. One of his clients was a was a company called EasyJet, and he worked out that um, with them, if they did a survey on this, and they they found out that you could go to Egypt for, and spend five hundred pounds for the entire month. Um, yeah, they do your laundry, you get all your meals and everything. So it's actually it was cheaper to move to another country and have a holiday for a month than to just live in your own, <laughs> in our own country. I thought those kind of things is yeah it's something that's quite quite fun and it's a it's a nice up. It's a nice thing to read in a way. It's, it's like taking something that's depressing but putting a positive, funny spin on it. It's just... Yes, and it has the effect, though, of getting that message across, right? It, right. It's one of those reframes that is um, it's packaged in lightness and humor right. and entertainment. Right. But, wow, the truth underneath is it's glaring. Yeah. yeah. But it's, um, I, I mean, there was another one he did, which I thought was brilliant, it was um, in the UK, we love tea. Um, <laughs> so we have tea and biscuits and then he was saying uh, that, that I think he was doing some work for McVitie's and it, uh, they, they've hired a, a chief biscuit investigator or something it was a, it was a chief dunker so they worked out how long yeah. you should dunk each biscuit for yeah. how many seconds the optimal dunk uh, you, if anyone's li- listening now so it was about 2.5 seconds I think was the about the idea <laughs> um, <laughs> it's just a bit of well, I, I mean, you know, Goodby Silvers and Partners, I'm so lucky to have been there for yeah. for the majority of my career because it, 
they really understand the power of humor mm -hmm. to help people see, you know, um, some really deep insights about culture, about how, about human behavior. Yeah. And, you know, we've done it for a lot of B2B businesses, which tend to be really dry when they communicate. Um, Adobe is one of my favorite ones that we worked on, but, you know, helping marketers understand and um, kind of laugh at themselves and the, you know, at the beginning of data and science that they didn't know what they were doing. It was all bullshit, you know, and we we're all bullshitting each other. And so I think there's such power in humor and um, we call it mass intimacy. Like when you, when you reveal an insight that everyone knows, everyone shares, but we don't talk about, and then you highlight it in an entertaining way and you get everyone to really laugh at themselves or see an opportunity to act differently and have shared language around it. it it's really powerful. And um, that still exists in what we do. And, and thanks. It looks like we're getting a bit more, and we're getting more of the sort of humor side of things and advertising as well. I've been doing some judging recently for some different awards. Oh. Uh, I'm, seeing, I'm seeing a lot more humor work this year. So um, I hope you get that more of that. Out of interest, do you have a, a favorite a favorite ad that you've worked on or or, uh, or that even if you've not worked on it? Well, I mean, we, we just came out of, and this is very U.S. centric, so we apologize about that. But we just came out of the Super Bowl and we had four different clients, you know, in it. and I, I think what I loved was the range of uh, work that we did, which is what I love about our agency is that it just doesn't have one type, one style. You know, we did everything from BMW with Christopher Walken to- I love that. Oh my word. Yes. Oh, Rich. Rich. Yes. Rich Silverstein and, um, and, and, and some uh, uh, South African creative directors. Oh, wow. So many people contributed to the making of that spot, but that was a highlight. Um, and then on the end, other end of the spectrum, um, Dinamita for Doritos, the two grandmas, the abuelas, you know, and Jenna Ortega. So just, I, I love the range that we bring to different clients. We had mullets for Kawasaki and um, and Mountain Dew with Aubrey Plaza. So it was really fun. It, it's a really fun showcase of where creative creativity can go. Wow. So if anyone's listening, you need to read the book and then and then phone Bonnie and try and get a job. Give the and see what You might be able to um, make some Super Bowl ads uh, with Christopher Walken. Um, um, <laughs> it would be amazing. Um, like I, I know you've been so kind uh, sharing so much time with us. And um, I just want to yeah, take, take the moment to say thank you so much for writing this book. And thank you for, so much for, for being so open and honest uh, with, with everything and, and open with your life and yeah, I really, really appreciate it, and it. I think, yeah, this this book, I can, I, I can see it's already helped a lot of people, and I hope it continues to help many, many more. And um, so, yeah, thank, thank you for being you, uh, Lady Bonnie. You're, you're a, you're a hero. Um, I'm gonna, I, I want to be in conversation with you all the time. I, I know you have a baby on the way, so my window is short. But being called Lady Bonnie is so, <laughs> such fun. But it was really fun also to just, um, move back and forth from the book and life to creativity and what we do in our industries. So thank you for hosting me. Uh, thank you. Thank you.